Assalamu alaikum. My name is Ali Hassan Kamran. I'm 35 years old and I was brought up in California. I currently reside in London and I work in cybersecurity. As I was growing up, this figure known as Imam Hussein Salam was prevalent um, all up during my upbringing, actually. Um, when I was little, my parents used to take me to the Husseiniya, the Imam Barga, regularly. And from the pulpit, I used to hear various orators tell me about this magnificent individual. And as a kid, we just thought that Imam Hussein Islam, was just this superhuman individual that had to endure a lot of suffering, a lot of pain in his life. Um, I saw my parents' reverence to Imam Hussein, and that has obviously trickled down onto me. My parents used to attend each and every uh, event that was linked to uh, this individual, to the Ahlul Bayt Salam, and I, I obviously were, I was with them every step of the way. And the ziyara, the visitation, of course, we've always heard from the pulpit how important it is, how people from the past have found great difficulty trying to reach uh, the venue uh, where Imam obviously resides currently. And we've heard stories, really bad stories, about how people have lost their lives even to, to get the, to this state. So visiting the Imam, the actual visitation, the ziyara, as we know is, or we, we've known, we've come to know that it, it wasn't as easy for the people of the past. Um, as, as I, when I was growing up, I saw many a people um, go on these pilgrimages or visitations to the Imam. And I would, I would always wonder, um, I would have this kind of fascination towards where I would want to go as well, this, this desire to go also. And uh, let's not forget how important uh, these visitations are as we were taught from, by our parents and from the orators on the pulpit. What I couldn't understand is why would perhaps people want to go um, in such dire circumstances where they may not be coming back. And I am obviously talking about, you know, when the, the, the tyrants were ruling over the land of Karbala and um, it wasn't as easy as getting your visa, getting on a plane and going. It was a lot more difficult and obviously we, we've heard reports where people actually lost their lives or at least a limb or two. Um, but I began to understand that as I got got older and wiser and understood better about my mola even understood what it means to have a master such as such as Abu Abdullah because he just wasn't our master before he still is his mission is very much alive his name is very much alive i mean heck the way people talk about him is as if he's around us he's still here and he wasn't some figure that was um, born centuries ago that in itself is quite unique and that was one of the reasons that I would want to go and visit uh, the Imam, his resting place and kind of begin to build a bigger bond with him, a closer, just get closer to him. And um, I know that one of the ways of doing that was to actually visit his shrine in the mausoleum and I was ready to make my journey very, very soon. How it actually happened is quite odd and strange. Um, as I begin to tell you, I'm, I'm also thinking how, if this was even true, um, I first have to kind of blame myself for being lazy when it comes to 
making it happen, making this visitation take place. But I knew I had this desire. And when it came to the Ahlul Bayt it was something about Imam Hussein that I really wanted to go and um, go to his shrine, go to his mausoleum first before I go on to the others. So how it happened was um, one day I'm just working away in London as normal um, and what's happening obviously around me at the time is there's preparations by all sorts of people. So some of my relatives, uh, friends, people from the mosque, they're getting ready to uh, go on Arbain um, to go and visit the Imam. And I know this is happening. There's a bit of a buzz in the air. It's obviously Safar um, that we're in, the month of Safar. Um, but even at that time, if you were to ask me if I was planning on going, no, I wasn't. And, and it was just a few weeks away, the actual event. So I wasn't planning on going. Like I didn't look at tickets or I didn't talk or speak to a, a kafila. A uh, person who manages a kafila, for example, or a group that can go. I was just going about my business. We were just attending majlises as normal. But as luck would have it, one day, and, and bear with me, I know it sounds a bit strange, I got a, a missed call from an unknown number. And it was just a number that's not in my contacts, but it was literally an unknown number. It was very long. Um, and it was a bit foreign looking. So I just disregarded it as a, as a telemarketer or something. I didn't really look into it. A day or two later, I got another missed call, similar looking number. And I'm like, you know what? Let me at least put this in Google and figure out what's going on. So I put the number in Google and I kid you not, it was in the vicinity of um, some city uh, in Iraq. Okay, so I, I can't say it was Karbala or Najaf, um, but what I did, as I like to do, um, I went and uh, messaged my family members in our WhatsApp group, and I kind of, as a little bit of a joke, I said to them, hey guys, um, I'm getting missed calls from Karbala and Najaf. And I was just joking. I still, at the time, I wasn't really thinking much about it. And as soon as my family members, especially my sister who read it, she just went berserk and said, go, you need to go. And that's when I, when I had a smile on my face as I was texting them, I kind of paused and took a step back and said, what is actually stopping me from going? And that was the first realization that, hey, let me try and do something. Let me actually put something in action to see if we can make this happen. So I know that some people were going, for example, my brother-in-law was going, so I contacted him. And he said, he was very welcoming to this idea. He said, all you need to do is apply for your annual leave and get me your passport. I will sort out the rest. So the day finally came, we arrived. And all of us that were together, we just, uh, first of all, got on a bus and coach and made our way towards our first destination, which was uh, Najaf. But on the way, uh, we did make a, um, a pit stop. Um, and that was my actual, my actual first touchdown in, in Iraq um, with the, the locals, with the local community of Iraq. And we stopped at uh, what was called a mokib. And this was really further away from Najaf still. We weren't there yet, but we needed like I said, a pit stop. And we got off the bus and coach and everybody kind of went their way. And I also went towards um, uh, the people, the organizers that were there. So I went towards the organizers that were there. What I experienced was something unique. So first I need to tell you that when we were little, we were taught and told by our parents to help the elderly. So whenever there was an auntie or an uncle that needed assistance, whether that may be a, a simple glass of water, we'd instantly get up off our seats and go offer it to our uncles, to our elders. And that's something that was kind of embedded inside us. So now in Iraq, when we get off the coach and I'm walking towards the organizers, I see an old man coming towards me and he's looking directly at me and he's coming towards me. And he puts out his hands in a very soft 
manner, and he and he says quietly in his own language, in, in Arabic, which I don't speak and I don't understand. But I kind of knew what he was asking. He was asking if I needed anything, if he could help me with anything. He could sense that I wasn't from around here. And he was trying to be really hospitable. He made gestures as, as if I wanted a drink, if he wanted, if he could get me some water or a little um, cup of tea or glass of tea. And I, I didn't really know how to respond to him because it's the other way around. I'm supposed to be serving you. I'm younger than you. You're my elder. I don't understand why you're coming to me um, as if I'm some big man. I'm just an average Joe. And um, he's saying, maybe you want to use the bathroom, like he's pointing towards uh, the, the facilities. And that made me really emotional because it hit me why he was behaving this way. He doesn't know me. I've never met him before in my life. But because I was now classified as a Zawar of Imam Hussein, and this old man wanted to serve the Zawar of Imam Hussein. So therefore he came and you could sense that he just wanted to help me and he wanted me to be comfortable. And obviously he knows that I'm here to visit the Imams and I'm just a pilgrim of the Imam. And that was my first interaction with the local community in Iraq. And I began to understand that people view you as a Zawar of Imam Hussein as something great, as something not normal. And that was my very first thoughts and um, about this, uh, the journey. That was how I began my journey. So we did our salah, we refreshed ourselves and we got back on the coach. And this time our destination was Najaf, which I was looking forward to. We arrived in Najaf and one of the first things that we all wanted to do was obviously visit the shrine of Imam Ali alayhi salam. Um, so we go in, um, obviously there's like a sort of a queue system, take your shoes off and get in there. Um, there were a lot of people at the time. Um, I went in, we went ahead and did our um, circulation of the shrine of the Zari and we came back out. Now I wasn't content. I'll be very honest with you. I was not content and as luck would have it, many, many of obviously our group mates wanted to go to their place of rest and just kind of wind down. But I, I just thought to myself, of, you know, I need to do this again. Luckily, one of the boys I was with, he had a lot of letters or uh, papers full of ziyarats and duas. And some of those papers had fallen inside the uh, mausoleum, so we thought because um, he wasn't able to locate some of them. And he's like, I think I need to go back. And that's all I wanted to hear. As soon as he said, I said, yes, let's go back in. I will go with you. This time, I went back in and I went straight to the Zari and I held on to it. And I actually started to speak to the Imam. I don't know what happened to me. It was something that I thought you were meant to do, you were supposed to do, and I did it. And I spoke to him and I was quite frank. And I, the first thing I said was, I haven't been a good follower of yours. I've committed a lot of sins, but I've come to you because I hear, I hear you can erase those sins. You can help me with that. And please make me a better follower. Make me a better mu'min, someone that you would perhaps be happy with one day, inshallah. And it was, it was around that, that conversation. And I felt when I came back out, a lot better. I felt more relieved because the first time I went around, it didn't hit the spot, but the second time it did. And I felt content and it was amazing to see. So now it was time to progress towards Karbala from Najaf, which means that I would now be partaking in the Arbain walk, the famous walk. So what we experienced in this walk was again a lot of hosp hospitality uh, from the local community. Um, everyone was there to assist you in some way, shape or form. If you're hungry, there's food available, hot meals even, not something that perhaps a takeaway. Um, there's water everywhere, there's fruits, there's teas and um, even 
even tissues. So if you needed to wipe your brow or you finished your meal and you need to wipe your mouth, there would be kids coming to you with tissue boxes. It was kind of, if you were to tell me this before I actually witnessed it myself, I would, I would have said that it's uh, kind of unimaginable. I would need to see this myself to you know, make sure it is happening. And lo and behold, it has, and it was. Um, it's truly amazing, absolutely mind-boggling that people, and then once I found out that they're not really well off financially, these individuals who come and assist you, they're, um, they're just regular folk like you and I, and they take f money and funds from their banks and from their savings to come and help. And they provide you with even small dates that you can eat and nourish yourself as you're walking. Absolutely amazing to see that these are the type of servants that Imam Hussein Islam has. So we carried on and obviously there's a, there's a system, there's like a numbering system where um, mokibs are positioned um, and you would know, and this is how you could actually relate and tell people, others in your group or what have you, where you are or, or you can use it to uh, set a meeting point, you know, mokib, number, etc, etc. So it's a, quite a long journey. I'm not sure exactly how long it is. Now, me personally, um, I was obviously with a group of guys. We didn't do the whole walk. Um, we were, I, I think we began a bit late than we should have because we arrived a little bit late. So we had to speed things up. So at times we would, we would just get the local small buses perhaps to, to assist us and drop us from one point to another point, get off, start walking again, spend a night there. And boy, one of the nights that we spent, it was basically like a warehouse and people had blankets and um, that's it really. I don't remember seeing a pillow there. But you know what, we didn't care. I honestly didn't care. That was a part of the adventure because I don't know, I felt inside that you kind of had to struggle to get to Abba Abdullah. It shouldn't be that easy because he's too big and you're too little. You know, it's not somebody you could just knock on the door and he'll open it for you. You know, you need to put in the effort. So I enjoyed every bit of it, even sleeping almost on the floor um, with a bunch of people just scattered around. Um, it, it, that was an, another adventurous or amazing experience. And obviously we kept moving forward, we kept going. And finally, be, before you knew it, we had reached just the outskirts of Karbala and we started seeing signs um, obviously in Arabic and some were, some were in English as well and you know that it was very close. So I could see the structure, I could see the dome. Um, the images that I had seen as I was being brought up um, on TV or in posters, I know where they got it from now. I mean, there it was in front of me, um, the real live thing. Finally, we get, get, kept getting closer. The dome and the mausoleum kept getting bigger and bigger and I entered in these massive gates, these big, big doors. Um, we went in, there was a lot of chanting, La Baik Ya Hussein. There was a lot of people uh, just, you know, you could hear them uh, in their own language, in their own style and customs, uh, speaking to the Imam very loudly. Now the Imam himself, He's obviously laid rest in a shrine, which was further back. We were just going to go from the um, enclosure area, the mausoleum, and just come back out. And that's exactly what we did. I mean, people are telling me, I was asking, where is the actual zari? Where is the shrine? And they said it was actually a little bit further up between those doors. I could see the doors. It was just really packed. Um, I don't blame the others by saying, look, it's probably, you won't even get to touch the zari. Maybe you want to come back later um, and so on and so forth. So I kind of went along with it until we came out to we went into Bainul Haramain and we just exited. Again, that feeling, that notion where I started to think myself, you've come from so far, you've gotten a plane and you traveled from one country to another for this exact moment. Why are you just walking right by and not going in? 
or you're supposed to. So I, this time on my own without anyone, I asked you know people to come with me, but they obviously wanted to go back and they had their um, they wanted to refresh or whatever. So I went back to the entrance, and again, it wasn't easy because it was a very slow process, and you're being you're kind of being pushed and shoved along along the way. So as soon as you enter again, I had to put, take my shoes off. I tried to place them in a, in a, in a area where I would remember where they were and I, hopefully I get them back. But again, that does, didn't matter. I entered slowly, made, made my way towards those doors that I seen earlier. I really wanted to touch the Zadi. It seemed difficult at the time, but I kept going and I kept going. I think I may have gotten this, this close before the final wave came and I had to go ride with it towards the exit of that room. Now, just to give you an idea, that room, uh, perhaps, uh, I mean, it could have accompanied maybe 100, 200 people at one time, maybe 100 people maximum, but there was like 10,000 people in there. And just to give you an understanding of how cramped it is, so I just did my salutations. I said my salams and did my du'as from which wherever I was at the time, which was obviously a few people away. There's a good seven, eight people in front of me towards the dhari. And then I had to make, I had to make my way out. There was really no other option. Uh, but I would, my heart was still much more content than it was just before where I had to literally walk by this place. Um, I felt satisfied because I did it on my own as well. I didn't really rely on anyone or any leader of our group to come, you know, take me there. And it was an adventure and I felt that my, actually, yeah, I mean, my mom was calling me and I had to go and I had to answer the call. And I was somewhat satisfied that I did. And finally, the time came to say goodbye. And I wasn't quite sure how I should be doing this. So the only thing I could remember is how everyone does it and that is that one little snippet in Ziyarat Ashura. So I'm, I'm obviously terrible with goodbyes and I wasn't quite sure how to say goodbye to your Mola, your Imam. And the only thing that would come to my mind is how we always se send our salutations to him. That was perhaps the best way that I could. So I said, Assalamu alaikum ya Aba Abdullah. And with that, I said goodbye. And that's probably the first time I wasn't happy anymore. I remember when I found out I was going, from the point I got on the plane, from when I arrived, from when I went to all the mausoleums, I was happy. I was excited because I finally got to meet the personalities that I've been told about, that have been talked about since day one. So as we were leaving, went back to the airport, getting back on the plane, I was feeling quite melancholy um, that this fantastic adventure of mine has now come to an end. One of the biggest changes that this journey ha made in me or I've accomplished perhaps is that whenever I would go towards perhaps doing something that is not acceptable, um, going towards a sin for example, I would remember my Imam. It felt like I made a covenant and a pact with him while I was there. And coming back to my normal life, I just didn't want to disappoint him by any of my actions. It's like he could see me now. And if he knew that me, the same person who came and said salam and admitted my faults and asked for betterment, and yet I go back to my daily routine and I start committing silly acts again. It, it just was harder for me to do sin and that, that's, I find that amazing. And obviously my salah became a bit better and obviously I'm trying to do it on time and just trying to be good really. And I feel perhaps inshallah that was a sign 
um, that, that perhaps my ziyara was accepted. So if I was to summarize my entire experience into one sentence, it would be that this was an Iman rejuvenator. It was one of the best means for myself to, to build a bond with my Imam and get closer to him and the Ahlul Bayt like no other. Let me tell you, Hussein. Let me tell you, Hussein. Let me tell you, Hussein.